it's such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm just going to pull up my slides. So as we're moving through this selection, I would suggest if you do speak of you so that you can still see me or interact with other people. The session is going to be structured so that I'm going to be moving through the two pictures and talking about the identities, the histories, the art readings. I'm also going to include some um, audiovisual descriptions of the pieces. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome um, people in this space that identifies visually impaired or neurodivergent, which I know that we've got with us today. It's such an honor to be able to share these pieces with you. Thank you so much. I will do my best to um, elaborate on these pieces as much as possible. The space will be open deliberately for another half an hour at the end as well. If there's anything you'd like to share with me or raise any accessibility issues, if I can make the space better, kinder, or more open for you, please do let me know and I'll work my hardest. Queer gaze and emotional erasure. There's me. Um, just to describe me at the moment, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and um, I am wearing a pale pink shirt with a pale pink bow tie with um, birds flying across it. And I feel exceptionally pretty. Content warning, LGBT histories can contain unpleasant and offensive treatments of those who do not conform to gender or sexuality norms of the time. A number of these histories read as cruel to us now. Um, they would have quite arguably at the time, but even more so now. Please be aware that as we enter into this, this is a consensual conversation, as is the fact that with one of the portraits, I will be discussing genital castration and the difficulties of searching and facing around these issues. It's not to be salacious, it's core and central to the reading of the piece, I would suggest. So if you don't feel comfortable with that section, I'll be making it aware that we're going to go into Tenduchi shortly. You can opt out or black out a screen if you'd prefer to on that section. Portrait of Gristo Fendu Tenduchi by Thomas Gainsborough. We know that this was painted in the late 1770s. It's on the cusp of the 1880s. It's a studio piece by Thomas Gainsborough. Thomas Gainsborough, the master of the, 17th, the 18th century portrait. Thomas Gainsborough, the most fashionable. Thomas Gainsborough, the Ferrari that everybody wanted. The social signifier that meant that you could communicate with people in that 1% bracket. Not only aspirational, but absolutely crucial to an expression of your identity and the power behind that identity. You didn't just choose Thomas Gainsborough because he was successful. You chose Gainsborough because he could communicate his ideas to a very rich and influential clientele. Anybody who was everybody was after Thomas Gainsborough. Therefore, by default, it was a political decision to, com to um, commission Gainsborough on that portrait. Let's start with the portrait itself. Gainsborough pictures Tenducci in midlife. Midlife to us would be around the 40s, 50s. Midlife at this period would equate actually to somewhere in your 30s, 40s, because life expectancy was significantly reduced. Tenducci is pictured as pallid. He looks down holding a sheet of music. He, his hair is swept back in what is not a contemporary fashion at the time. It's actually quite old fashioned. It speaks of the fop and the dandy. His hair is powdered, uh, swept back, curls intricately laden. The piece is unfinished. We know that this was unfinished. It was abandoned by um, Gainsborough Studio. We know that a second piece exists. Two portraits exist of Gainsborough and then a number of prints. Speculation as to why this portrait was unfinished, we'll come to in a bit, but keep that in mind that this was unfinished and the power of the unfinished piece. The details of the sheet music, the buttons running down uh, Tenducci's jacket, the soft folds of the brown material and the mottled background that has earthy, warm, rich tones contrasts massively with the pallor of Tenducci's painted face. Tenducci is heavily made up in this piece. Typical of a Gainsborough portrait, um, 
Gainsborough would have focused his attention on the hands, the face and the composition and left the later pieces to studio artists to complete. Therefore, we have a very intimate portrait of Tenducci in terms of the face, but as the detail disappears further out into the portrait, so does the detail. It evaporates away into a kind of dreamscape of blurry mist as we consider what could have been in this portrait. It hints at details, the ruffles on a starched jacket, the crisp white linen that kind of envelops the chest that is frothing out, the sensible nature of the jacket but the elaborate buttons, a small twinkle of gold on the lapels. This would have been far more richer and more elaborate had it been finished I would argue. As the Tenducci piece we get closer to it we start to focus on the brush strokes and Gainsborough's incredible use of light Notice the flecks of light on the forehead, the chin, the cupid's bow, and also on the tip of the nose. Tenducci looks away from us as he looks down. Voluminous, sensuous lashes frame a face that is at once regal, but also pulled away from us. There is a softness to this face. The face is not of hard lines. However, it speaks of fleshy, warm tones. Blushes of pink hide beneath the lead oxide paint that covers Tenducci's face. Tenducci is wearing his natural hair. We can see that by the hairline and how it's drawn back. As we get even closer to Tenducci, his breath is inhaled. He is caught at a moment, perhaps capturing a high note. Tenducci was a castrato. A castrato is a very difficult subject to consider in art because it was the practice of taking children, particularly male children, and castrating them to enable them to stop going through puberty. Their voices would never fully develop. They would retain the tones of a child that his voice had not broken. Therefore a purity, a highness of voice, a quaver that would never disappear, that puberty brings on the onset of a deeper voice. What Tenducci is caught in this moment doing for us is inhaling ready to hit a very strong high note, demonstrating his virtuosity. As I get closer to Tenducci and I consider the intimacy of this piece, as we reach now towards Tenducci, I can see the brush strokes on the face. I can start to see the cracking of the paint as we zoom in closer to Tenducci. His lips are flushed with the energy, as are his eyes, but his eyes are cast down away from us. This is one of the things that really concerns and moves me as I read this portrait. Tenducci is not interacting with us. Tenducci is the object. Tenducci is on display. Tenducci is the body. Tenducci is objectified by being a castrato first and foremost. He's performing for us. He's not engaging with us. He looks down from the sheet. He looks down from us towards the sheet music. Now the notion of a castrati, of taking somebody's um, development through puberty and removing that by an act of violence, a non-consensual act of violence, is deeply concerning. Tenducci is arguably defined not by his genitalia, not by social norms of uh, binary male or female as seen at the time, but he becomes suspended in a state by which he operates under estrogen and testosterone. One of the side effects of uh, being castrated, for example, is the fact that you produce far more estrogen, your skin becomes softer, your body hair becomes less, your voice doesn't develop, but there is a host of psychological effects to being castrated as well. Um, inability to regulate your hormone levels, crashing levels of anxiety, depression, aggression. There is real psychological harm caused by the act of castration that is medically regulated now by people that are living with that condition. This was forced on Tenducci. Tenducci stops reading as binary male in our traditional or the historical sense because it becomes suspended by this act of violence between those two states. He lacks manhood, he lacks maleness, he, has the, he loses the vigour associated with a historical man. 
Similarly, the softness, the feminism bleeds through. He becomes a conjoining of both of those. From a queer perspective, it's fascinating to read Tenducci as a non-binary body, but this isn't a consensual non-binary body. And that is what's really disturbing to me. Notions of gender fluidity, of effeminacy, of our identities as male, female, how we choose to present to our, the world was denied Tenducci. This was removed from him. And instead, Tenducci is presenting as a result of an act of violence towards him. But nonetheless, from my reading and from a number of perspectives, Tenducci reads as a non-binary body. Tenducci does not operate as male. The code words and the queer coded messages that come through on Tenducci are absolutely enormous. Coded messaging in art is one of the most powerful forms of nonverbal communication for me. It's one of the most effective and it's one of the most emotionally honest, I would argue. As we look to the portrait of Tenducci, we lack any of the history behind Tenducci. Very little survives of Tenducci. We have nearly nothing surviving of Tenducci in his own testimony. It's about letters from society figures talking about Tenducci. What we do have commissioned by Tenducci though, is this amazing portrait in the Barber Collection by Gainsborough. This is one of the few examples of Tenducci directly reaching across the centuries, across time, to communicate with us directly. If we presume that all of these choices are not accidental, but rather deliberate, how Tenducci curated himself, it becomes a conversation that he's having. Those coded messages are picked up on by queer people. Queer people starved of queer narratives, of the ability to speak openly about lives, loves, lived sexuality and gender experience, use coded messages in history to communicate with us now. The presumption being, that by presenting themselves, they put an image in our heads. That image can be questioned or it can be accepted. If, for example, I looked at this and I presumed that Tenducci's gay, he could have turned around to me and said, no, that's just in your mind, that's what you're presuming, I'm not saying that. If I presume though that Tenducci was gay, I think to myself, oh, I recognise that. There is a subtle interchange of ideas, of acceptance, of recognition, a number of people historically have referred to this as gaydar or as queering. What it is though, is a very effective form of communication. There is no right or wrong. There is only what we see and what we feel. And as an arts educator and historian, that was one of the things I would deeply encourage you to hold on to. The historical evidence and what is presented on labels and what is presented to us in collections is not the whole story. How you feel, what you think, your emotional reaction completes and enhances that story. Tenducci presents to us as the fop, the dandy. Constantly throughout letters and descriptions of Tenducci, he is referred to as extravagant, elaborate, vain, loud, spendthrift. Words that are heavily coded for queer ears. Could we use the word camp instead of those words? Could we call him a queen? That's one of the things that we bypass in terms of art history and art history in general. This was written and created at a time of illegality or by people and consecutive generations that have had to avoid these conversations, that these conversations are dangerous or destructive to have in some way. Therefore, we rely on queer coded messages to really build it. But to queer something is to actively take advantage of and take ownership of our feelings as we look at those. When I consider that Tenducci was loud, elaborate, the flamboyant, a centre of attention, that is camp. Camp in its essence for me. Therefore, I feel a recognition, I feel a, a kinship, a connection with him beyond the words and the pieces that I see. Tenducci was famous within his lifetime, a huge celebrity. Mozart and Bach wrote for him. He arrived in England in the 1750s and was an overnight sensation automatically. In an age when the castrati were swamping the market, bear in mind that thousands of children were subjected to genital mutilation to create them as castrati. Tenducci stood out so much so that Mozart and Bach wrote for him. One of the travesties and one of the most painful pieces of history for me is that those pieces don't survive, nor does Tenducci's reaction to them. But Tenducci was a celebrity in his own right. 
In the 1760s, he moved to Scotland where he became particularly famous and garnered a lot of attention. People were paying substantial amounts of money to see Tenducci live. It was in Scotland at this time that Tenducci was married to his wife, Dora. Dora was the wife of a very rich banker and the marriage was engineered and created. A fascinating piece of history in itself because the marriage lasted for nine years before being nulled on the grounds of impotency and non-consummation, which legally was the only grounds by which a woman could divorce her husband. Consider that for a moment, another queer coded message, a marriage not consummated, a marriage created from a very rich family. We know from contemporary records of Tenducci that he was constantly in debt. Consider the unfinished nature of this portrait, for example. We know in the 18th century, portrait painters worked on credit. They gave up or stopped or abandoned portraits if they felt that their clients were not going to pay them. Why did Gainsborough stop this portrait in the first place? It's indicative of Tenducci's lifestyle, the extravagance, but also the mental health behind that. Tenducci was heavily in debt and gambling, symptomatic perhaps of a wider mental health crisis that he was going through and a reliance on gambling and finances to get him through. A a prudent marriage to a very wealthy banker's daughter brought with it wealth and security. Annulled nine years later though, was this annulled by the fact that Tenducci was castrati, therefore he couldn't consummate the marriage, or that Tenducci was living a queer life? This is one of the pieces that constantly tears me, and I keep coming back to the fact of it, is that was Tenducci queer and living a queer life under his own volition? Or was Tenducci a result of that violent act? I can't speculate as to Tenducci's sexuality. I would question if I have a right to, as well, use a label that Tenducci may not have used himself. But what is known is that the marriage lasted nine years. In Casanova's famous diaries as well, one of the admissions is that his wife Dora bore two children, but we don't know whose children they were. We know that Dora, if that account is to be believed, was sexually active and had two children. Therefore, where does that leave us? It leaves us with a fascinating glimpse into a relationship that may be coded and may read as queer. Why would you marry a queer spouse who was broke and in debt? There are actually huge benefits historically to marrying a queer spouse, not namely the fact that the woman would have a number of security and freedom otherwise not offered to her. If we know that Dora did indeed have extramarital sex and that Dora was a mother to two children, she was finding sexual fulfillment and pleasure elsewhere under the security and the respectability of a, of a marriage. Bear in mind that a woman legally did not enjoy the same rights as an unmarried woman. This was a proven, clever move, particularly so to marry a husband that laid no claim on her, either sexually, emotionally, or gave her freedom financially, which is what Tenducci did. When the marriage collapsed, Tenducci fell ever further into debt. As Tenducci's life rolls on, culminating in his death in 1791, Tenducci reads as a very pathetic figure by the letters of the time. He's constantly referred to as begging and conjoling his friends for money. There is a tragedy to Tenducci in that he is riddled with debt, but he occupies this strange ambivalence. He dazzles at night. He is the, uh, he's this strange twilight queer body, which is celebrated in the evenings with lavish parties, recitals, which would have included alcohol and cocaine, which were prevalent at the time. However, was he respectable during the day? We know nothing of Tenducci. Tenducci becomes this twilight queer creature operating a nightlife existence. He operates on the fringes of society and acceptability in terms of respectability because he is this nightlife creation and creature. Tenducci is inherently for me a queer body. But when I read into Tenducci and I start to explore Tenducci, it goes deeper than that. As Tenducci is pictured here, he is defined as a dandy or a fop. What's fascinating is from the 1780s onwards, there was a vogue, particularly in men, but also increasingly in women, towards naturalism, 
towards a fresh faced view towards recapturing nature, a simplicity from the extravagance of when Tenducci first arrived in London. But Tenducci has not chosen to embrace that fashion. Tenducci looks old fashioned for the time in which he is painted. He is deliberately portraying to us as a fop and a dandy and the associated values inside of that. Tenducci embraces the effeminacy of this portrait and the affectation and the styling as a deliberate move to communicate to us who he is. Tenducci could have very easily chosen to have his hair unpowdered, to look naturalistic, to be looking at us. Instead, Tenducci composes himself as the dandy on the fop. Again, you would argue a coded message as he reaches out to us, as he reaches out to a place that is intimate and is real inside of his own lived experience. But again, I'll go back to the fact that this is all speculation. This is speculation based on contemporary queering and contemporary uh, sociology and sexuality. It was illegal to be queer in Tenducci's time. It was illegal in this country up until 1967, 1969, arguably. What is fascinating about this work, however, is the concept of the queering and what it looks like. As a queer audience member, as somebody queer, I reached to this not because of what I know about the history, but because it feels queer to me. And I ask you to embrace that feeling as we consider the next piece, which is Countess Golovine. Now, I'm going to take a couple of minutes just to kind of take, a, take an emotional breath as you process Tenducci. Please do let me know in the comments section what you're thinking, how you're feeling about these pieces. Use the comments section to communicate, not just with me, but with each other. I think a really nice well-being action is that we take this time to send a message of solidarity to other people within this space. A number of us are isolated, we can't access the Barber Collection because it's not open, but a number of us can't access large swathes of the country and or each other. So use the comment section not only to explore the queerness in your feelings, of uh, my reading on Tenducci. Please challenge me on my reading of Tenducci. Do you agree? But also use that space to communicate with other people, to find camaraderie, to send a message to the other people in this space, demonstrating warmth and support in a medium that is very impersonal and lacks humanity. Let's use the comment section to really uplift and develop the well being of the people that we've got the privilege of sharing the space with. I'll give you a couple of minutes. I'm going to check back in. Becca, could you let me know in the comment section if there are any questions or reactions, please? I haven't got any at this stage, John, but um, well, here we go. Here's, here's one uh, just coming in. Can you tell us more about the castration process that produced castrati? When did it start and when did it stop? The castration process was, there was two versions. You could either cut the blood supply to the testicles or you could remove the testicles. One obviously was more dangerous than the other. A number of children did not survive the castration process. At its height, there is an estimate that about 4,000 children um, in a space of a decade were being castrated. This remained legal until the 1860s when it was finally outlawed. So for a hundred, nearly a hundred years after this portrait was first created, castrati was still being used, marketed and taken. There was a huge market for castrati and this form of abuse, I would argue, only stopped as it fell out of fashion and vogue. Thank you for your question. High five. I'm gonna move on to Golovine. Countess Golovine, uh, Elizabeth Vigiela Brum. Um, this was made within the same lifetime as Tenducci and Gainsborough's work. We also know that Countess Golovine herself, the lady pictured in the portrait, um, did visit London at the turn of the century. So she would have been around at the same time as um, Tenducci. There is a possibility their lives may have even overlapped. 
This was made in 1797 to, 17, uh, to 1800 in Moscow, and again, it's an oil on canvas. As I describe Golovine to you and the portrait of Countess Golovine by Vigée Le Brun, the first word is exquisite. Again, it's a dreamy landscape whereby there is no background at all. The central focus is on the Countess herself. She looks to us with arm brought up around her right arm, circles her chest and her abdomen and curls just underneath her chin. She wears the most contemporary fashions as seen in the near turban hairstyle that she's wearing. Wild elaborate curls fall naturalistically down into her dress, but we can't see them fully as Vigée Le Brun takes advantage of a beautiful scarlet shawl or cape that envelops her. The sensuality of this piece is extraordinary. Not only does it hang across her arm, but it falls in the most delicate, voluptuous, almost sexual folds across the body. It's a sensual riot of shape and design that highlights curvature, it highlights, it hugs to the body with an intimacy that is matched by the gaze. Piercing blue eyes stare out from a pale face. And usually for the time as well, Golovine is painted with a hint of a smile. There is a warmth, there is an intimacy to this look coupled by the rouged cheeks that add to that flush of youth that is astonishing. The work itself is one of the greatest pieces, arguably, that Vigée Le Brun ever did. This is a world famous piece. It tours regularly. And I'm aware that people travel from across the country and around the world to sit and spend time with Countess Golovine. Countess Golovine weaves an incredible spell on us because unlike Tenducci, she looks directly to us not just unwaveringly, but with a piercing intimacy. There is a warmth, a familiarity. As we look at Golovine, she looks directly back at us. She and I are the center of that relationship. She is looking at you completely. She doesn't care about the background. You are the center of her gaze. You are the center of that warmth, that familiarity. There is a love that emanates from this gaze that is beautiful and enveloping and intoxicating. It's like greeting a friend. There is not only an acceptance to this gaze, but there is a beauty and an intimacy that is astonishing for that period. When a number of Vigie Le Brun's works, for example, are uh, sitters with pursed lips, but they look back at you very doe-eyed or they will look away. And usually Countess Golovine pictured in this portrait looks back at us unflinchingly hints of wealth, but also a timelessness as captured by the turn of the century fashion that she's modeling, which is inspired by Grecian looks and Grecian discoveries and also Roman fashion. She's swathed in these elaborate folds of costume with an intimacy and a detail that has been worked on by Vigée Le Brun, which is extraordinary. There is a passion that has gone into this work that starts to unravel as we get closer to uh, Countess Golovine. Now Vigée Le Brun was one of the most celebrated artists and one of the very few female artists that gained notoriety, popularity and success in the 18th century. Vigée Le Brun was lucky in the sense that she was the daughter of an artist and the wife of an artist and an art dealer. Those two patriarchal forces in her life not only recognised the talent that she had, but enabled her to operate with some independence, to operate commercially, and did key introductions that eventually ended her working in the court of Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette was fascinated and entranced, not only with her talent, but also with the fact that this was a young, fashionable, beautiful, as we would imagine pictured in her self-portrait, woman with self-assuredness and a confidence, a confidence so different to a number of the other artists operating in this field. She was born and raised to be an artist and pursued that with vigour. She was brought into the circle of Marie Antoinette. We know that she painted her more than 30 times and estimates suggest other portraits could have existed that have no longer survived. She was one of her favourite portraitists. She would have enjoyed an intimate time with 
the Queen, access to the Queen and her court, a court that was dogged by scandal, a court that was queered within its own lifetime. Politically, the scandal around Queen Marie Antoinette was raised that Marie Antoinette was a lesbian, that Marie Antoinette was depraved in her lust, that no woman or man was safe around her, that her whole point was pleasure, indulgence, excess. And one of the ways in which that excess manifested itself in terms of the broadsheets and the propaganda against her was in lesbianism. A number of pornographic images have survived of um, the Queen. Now, Vigie Le Brun was part of her circle, and in the politics of discrediting, attacking and ridiculing the Queen, referring to her as a lesbian was incredibly powerful. It disrupted the heterosexual narrative of the Queen as mother of the nation, and it relied on a religious belief that um, queerness, homosexuality, lesbianism was a conscious decision, an active sin. It was to choose to debase yourself, not a positive action, or certainly for the contemporary period, not a natural or responded to as a considered natural sexual response. They used the stigma as a political weapon to attack Marie Antoinette and her intimate circle. Vijay Lebron was part of that circle, therefore she was defined and labelled and accused of lesbianism and queerness within her own lifetime. Already as this portrait had been made, Vigée Le Brun, the artist, had already been queered. Her name was associated with lesbianism. Similarly, the Countess that is pictured here was um, one of the, it's, when you look at her biography, for example, the, her main claim to historical fame was that she was a maid of honor to Queen Catherine II of Russia. But before she met Vigée Le Brun, she was involved in another quote unquote scandal where she was seen as dangerously close to and intimate with a woman and had to flee from St. Petersburg to go to Moscow. The two women both operated in these homoerotically, homo-charged and politically queered circles already before they ever met. Vigée Le Brun was incredibly successful in the French court up until the French Revolution, at which time she fled with her nine-year-old daughter, but did not flee with her husband, interestingly enough. Now, as the French Revolution raged, uh, her clients are losing their heads, all the wealth is being redistributed within France, where would you go to recreate the court and your success? The answer is Imperial Russia and Moscow, which is where she fled to. She established herself and re-established herself in the court and created the most beautiful, iconic works of Russian aristocracy, which is where she was introduced to and met um, Countess Golovine. We know from contemporary records that the two women enjoyed a relationship that was considered remarkably close at the time. Now bear in mind this is the 18th century and this is the age of sentimentality. This is the age of growing emphasis on the aching love that you can show for each other. My feelings overwhelm me. I love you more than life itself. Sentimentality was in vogue and it was also a method of communicating. At a time when sentimentality was the norm, her relationship between Golovine and Vigée Le Brun was considered extremely sensitive. It was considered extremely warm. That shows the level of intimacy that these two women enjoyed. We also know that they spent time together in the, the Countess's lakeside villa, and they spent a summer together creating art and as companions. Again, the queer coded messages start to scream through to us. The idea of the companion, the intimacy that moves through. As we queer these pieces though, and just like with Tenjichi, we go back to the fact that Countess Golovine, Vigée Le Brun, they were all married, therefore they can't possibly be queer because they were in a heterosexual relationship? No. What's fascinating about that is that it becomes a default position where it's a, an excuse not to queer something. How could they possibly be anything other than heterosexual if they're in a heterosexual marriage? Whereas we know with Countess Golovine, both before and after Vigée Le Brun, she enjoyed intense, passionate relationships with other women queered within her own lifetime. The coded messages and the evidence starts moving towards us at a massive rate, but it's not enough because neither the sitter, the artist, nor Tenducci have we've left any record to say that I am queer 
I felt this, I was this, I had this sexual attraction, this was my gender binary. That language itself didn't even exist in a contemporary vernacular. When we consider the diaries though of Vigée Le Brun and Countess Golovine, that's when the story really comes alive for me. The sections in both women's diaries, which they kept throughout their lives, that not only refer to each other, but refer to their time when they're at that lakeside villa, have been edited and censured by their descendants. Their Victorian ancestors removed large swathes of text and information from their diaries. That information was destroyed and erased. Why would you do that? Was it because there was political conversation between the two women that in later generations was no longer safe? Possibly. Or was it the intimacy between the two women and the way the two women were not only expressing their feelings to each other, but recording and diarising their feelings towards each other? Why would you remove that evidence and this itself becomes part of the query. Two women who have a, a, who have a historical record of intense, passionate relationship between each other. The one source of evidence that we would reach to where we know they corresponded and documented their relationship has been censored and removed by later generations. Why would you do that? Because of shame, because of erasure, because of a movement away from the 18th century into the 19th century, where 18th century morality was considered to be um, extravagant, spendthrift, um, that it was associated with revolution, that it was too much or camp. What is fascinating about this time period is that this evidence was removed from us. And this is one of the things I would argue about querying. The absence of evidence is evidence. When we look to querying, we have to, a number of historical sources have, have said, well, unless we have an exact account, it's speculation. Speculation is a form of querying. Speculation on our readings on this is evidence, because that lack of evidence is a signifier and a coded message in itself for us to reach to. If we relied on the evidence itself, few, if any, figures in history could be authentically coded as queer. Yet as queer people, as allies, we feel a sense of kinship, the emotion that we connect as we move closer to Golovine's gaze is not only fascinating but palpable. Art history teaches us to ignore our feelings and instead rely on the fact, yet queering and to queer and to feel a queer kinship is an instinctive queer feeling. Sometimes if you look at something that is queer and you are asked to articulate as to why it is queer, it's really difficult. One of the most honest and expressive answers you can give is because it feels queer to me. As I look into the eyes of Golovine and I consider Golovine's history and Golovine's story, I'm enveloped in a, a feeling of queerness, a feeling of otherness, a feeling of deliberate historical erasure around a subject that was both powerful and personal, that is fossilized in art and captured in that gaze. It's also a gaze for me that questions our ego and our rights to access this piece. I've seen firsthand, and I've experienced it myself, when I'm in the gallery looking at this piece, oh, excuse me, I did look burp, that's a bit rude. When you're in the gallery and you're interacting with this piece, there is a power to it, a magnetism, that sometimes the digital image can convey, but there is a difference, I would argue, in terms of the physical proximity and the proportion seeing this up close. People feel special by this piece, I would argue, because it's all about us and our ego. Golovine is looking at us. She is the centre of attention. She is the object by which is presented to us. Golovine is there for us, very much in the same way that Tenducci is presented to us as an object, something to be consumed, a queer body to be objectified and to be used much in the same way that Golovine could be arguably. But what's fascinating about that is the intimacy of the queer gaze and erasure. There is an element missing to this relationship that we as art viewers don't acknowledge. I would argue that Golovine isn't looking at us as the art viewer, nor does she care about us. This is the fossilised remains of Countess Golovine looking into the eyes of the artist Vigée Le Brun as she painted her. This was painted from life. This was painted based on an intimacy, a feeling, 
a close proximity that is both physical and emotional. We've intruded on that. We've moved inside the gaze. It's no longer about the relationship between those two women, the setter and the artist. We've intruded on that. When I consider that from a queer gaze and a queer perspective, I feel awkward like a gooseberry. I feel like I've stepped in front of a couple on a date and I'm like, oh, sorry, oh, that was a moment. I didn't mean to do that. It's fascinating to look into the eyes of Golovine and we see and feel a reaction, but Golovine isn't looking at us. Golovine is looking at Vigée Le Brun. She's looking at Vigée Le Brun with magic in her eyes. Vigée Le Brun in turn is changing that. So one of the most fascinating things when you're looking at close at this image, for example, is the eyes are pictured as ovals rather than as circles. This is an optical illusion because the piece would have been looked at from slightly above us on an eye line. Therefore, by creating the ovals, it elongates the face and it creates a depth of field. We're not supposed to be looking dead on directly to this beautiful alabaster white face. It's a face swathed in love as well. We know that Golovine at this time was a middle-aged woman, yet she's painted not only with an intensity, but also an ageless characteristic that is queer and alien in itself. I struggle to pinpoint the age of the Countess. But when I'm this close, I can start to see the shadow was under her eyes. I can start to see the blood vessels on her nose. I can start to see the broken blood vessels underneath her eyes. She is at once young and at the same time middle-aged, ageless and yet tender. It's the most incredible piece as we get closer to, oh, sorry, I clicked too hard. It's the most intense and tender work as we get up close to it. And this is that level of intimacy. Couple that intimacy with queer coded gazes and queer coded messages. And we're coming into something that is powerful and poignant and absolutely beautiful. As I move back into speak of you, can I check in with Becca, please, in terms of questions, comments, reactions, sharing that's happening? Yeah, thanks, John, for that. We've had a few questions here. Um, firstly, do we know anything about what happened to Dora after the marriage was annulled for Ten Tenducci? Good question. Absolutely no idea. I think. The difficult thing about Tenducci is that such little information survives on him and as his wife she would have enjoyed um, nearly no legal um, autonomy in terms of herself and we rely on the historical evidence of contemporary correspondence between men about men and also the, the historical record which did not recognise um, Tenducci's wife as an independent individual, 18th century law categorized a wife as a property or a piece of ownership by the man. Therefore, we really struggle to find evidence. Mm. Thanks, John. There's another one here. Um, there's all the stuff that you said about estrogen and androgens. Um, this was a bit quick for me. Is there anything of this based on historic descriptions or is this derived of what we know about these powerful hormones these days? The secondary in terms of what we know medically that people go through in terms of castration. But for me, the evidence comes not only in Tenducci's portrait himself and the softness, the ambiguity that the face puts forward, the fact that he's clean shaven and there's no stubble, but also by the fact that we have so much evidence in terms of what castration does to bodies and the damage it does to bodies. And I think we can read and overlay on that. We know as a historical fact that he was a castrati. Therefore, we know as a medical diagnosis, not only symptomatically what he would have gone through, but also the variance in terms of hormone levels. If we apply that over the top of the language that is used historically around Tenducci, vain, extravagant, loud, this strange creature that people could not define and found very difficult to articulate in terms of gender programs or male or female. It becomes an interesting soup, not only a presupposition, but also of us putting the pieces together. 
Um, lots of comments saying how fantastic the talk is, John. Um, another couple of questions. Um, I've always wondered about what happened to Vijay Lebrun's husband. I've only ever read that he didn't flee from France with her and their child. If he was killed in the revolution, surely that would have been known or more explicitly shared. John, do you have any further info? No, but legally you would presume that he is still um, alive because Vijay Lebrun uses the title of Mrs. She doesn't renounce that title. Also, she retains legal guardianship of the daughter. And as a widowed woman, that could be contested by the family. It's interesting to ask why the husband didn't go with her as she went into exile. France must have been extraordinarily dangerous for their family, not only as creatives, but also with the association to Marie Antoinette and the allegations of lesbianism and the queerness around his own wife. Why was it safer to not be with his wife than to be apart from her? I think, again, it's a coded piece of history that the husband's voice is muted and the husband backs away, relies on the relationship or the, the fame of the wife. I think for me, there's no evidence that he did die and I'm not aware of a time in which he died. I've got no death date, unfortunately, to offer you. Therefore, it becomes part of the queer coded puzzle that if their relationship was that intense or cooperative or functional, why did the family not flee together and remain together? Mm. Um, another comment. Um, can you say something about the often higher standard of evidence and the smoking gun that is often required to tell queer stories or interpret collection items as queer and why we often get companions or live together throughout their lives? Absolutely. And I think it's a very dangerous opt out of the conversation in itself. I think it's an inherited baggage that we've had from people that were describing these portraits at a time of illegality. But also there's a, a sociology around the alienation of these pieces. And it feeds really interestingly into Tenducci, but more so I'd argue with the portrait of Countess Golovine. This piece is absolutely loved and adored by people. They go out of their way to access this piece, not only in terms of their emotions, but also financially, traveling to it, buying reproductions, having versions of it. I've got a key ring, do you know what I mean? What is fascinating about this piece is that it's put on such a pedestal, but the conversation around it is not fully rounded. So for example, consider if you absolutely adored this piece, but defined yourself as homophobic, how would you reconcile the knowledge or the reading on this work that Golovine is queer, that Golovine could be queered, that something so intrinsic to what you love could be counter to your own beliefs, or that conversely that Golovine is rejecting us, not in favour of her gaze, but that she's looking passionately back at Vijay Lebrun, not us. How do we cope with that in terms of our egos? And a number of art viewers simply don't. They don't want pieces queered, or they don't want to consider queer narratives, or they may be operating in cultures and societies whereby there are serious repercussions to do so, either legally or socially. Therefore, it's not, they're not able to do so. Therefore, it only falls down to the smoking gun that forces their hand, I would suggest. Whereas queering, for me, is a very intimate process that is about a recognition of that feeling, of acknowledging us as individuals, of connecting to artworks far beyond ourselves with empathy. To start to round it up in terms of the summary, one of the things I'm absolutely fascinated with is, have I got the right to say any of this? And I find that really fascinating. I am somebody that studies art, that cares about art, that has the privilege of working with art. Do I have the right to define or queer these works in any way, shape or form? This for me starts to unravel the conversation around queer erasure and erasure of queer histories. It's not the absence of evidence, it's what we do with what's there 
and we grip onto it so tightly and so ferociously because in queer communities and in allied communities there is such a deficit of evidence of companionship in history of recognition of seeing either positive or negative icons that reflect ourselves the pain of looking at a collection that you absolutely adore and not being able to see yourself your lived experience or somebody that cares or would um, empathize with your life and your lived experience is incredibly painful to love art simultaneously and to look at pieces and not find any acceptance, not find anyone that is like you, not find any kinship or camaraderie, leaves with us as queer audiences, I would argue, such a level of pain and detriment that we reach to these objects and we use contemporary society to say, well, queer, and I'm gonna read it this way, and it's, it's no longer illegal for me to say these words or attach this label, and I feel proud of my identity. I wanna share it with this person, and I'm confident in terms of who I am and what I believe. But it's the frailty of the evidence that starts to unravel. It's not necessarily the lack of the evidence. It's that as queer audiences, we grip onto this, this evidence so tightly, we're at risk of damaging it by the force of belief. It's not only the fact that I see coded messages and the absence of evidence is evidence itself, is that it hurts me to lack that evidence, that I desperately in myself wish to see and find that. Am I looking for something that isn't there? Am I projecting from a contemporary standpoint uh, a view, a sociology, a wish that the portraits and themselves simply cannot ever give me? That for me is queer erasure, that level of pain that I have to work so hard in art to find something that not only represents me, but also challenges me and pulls at me in terms of my own identity. That is how I would define queer erasure in art. It's not the removal of evidence, it's not the coded messages, it's how tightly we grip this evidence, how much it means to us and how much these pieces mean to us. Is queer a reality for these pieces? I don't know. One thing I do know as an arts educator is how I feel and how audiences feel. And I've seen people in tears in front of these artworks, feeling a sense of connection, empowerment, catharsis, validation. Even if that is just a feeling to you and you're working on historical presupposition, I would suggest embrace that feeling. Queer cannot be defined by other people for us much in the same way that safety cannot be defined by other people for us. I do not wait as an individual for permission to consider something queer. Instead, I rely on my feelings and my intuition. And if it looks queer and I reach to it and it causes me a sense of queerness in myself, I embrace that. And then I read into the piece and I enjoy the historical evidence on top, but I constantly question my right to do so. Ironically, in the course of querying these pieces and the erasure, I learned very little about Tenducci, Golovine, Cantus Vijay Lebrun. All the questions and the presupposition comes back to me questioning myself, to questioning the people in this room, to questioning those around us as to the validity of this conversation. It's a really powerful point. And I think queer erasure can be really cleverly and succinctly defined by the fact that in a number of heterosexual and heteronormative narratives, there's no work needed. And that work is not being done and people are not having this conversation. Why do we have to work this hard to achieve a level of that queerness? That for me is queer historical erasure and sharing the space and the emotion behind these pieces with you is not only a privilege, but it enriches me sharing these pieces that I care about so much. As a well-being act, as we close, I would encourage you to share your feelings, not only about these pieces with other people in the room, but also reach out to the barber itself and its collection. It's a collection that can't be accessed at the moment other than digitally, but it's staffed by a team that cares incredibly about the connectivity and these pieces. If you're missing the barber, if you're missing that level of connection, send a message in the chat to the gallery and to the practitioners to show that because it really feeds into the dynamic of how these pieces are being used and it's an incredible privilege to be in this space with you you're such a lovely bunch i'm glad i got dressed up for you 
Becca, can I hand back to you for questions, comments, or any sharing? Thank you so much, John. It was a real pleasure to have you um, speaking with us this evening. Uh, lots of claps all round. Um, lots of fantastic comments in the chat for you. Um, brilliant and eye-opening as always. Wonderful, John. Thank you.